You'd think that studios would be invested enough in their major franchises or potential major franchises to know why they work and to commit to some consistency in their presentation across the different movies. But sometimes filmmakers simply forget, or worse, ignore, what it was that made the characters so great in the first place. I'm Josh from WhatCulture.com, and these are nine movies that completely misunderstood their own characters. Number nine, A Good Day to Die Hard, the character John McClane. In the first three Die Hard films, John McClane is the archetypal rat up a drain pipe character, resourcefulness by necessity and as tenacious as he is vulnerable. He is effectively the anti-action hero, uncouth, outrageous and always unexpected. But by the time A Good Day to Die Hard came out, the studio had completely forgotten what McLean was and instead clearly just looked at Bruce Willis's other, more recent action films from the time. And spoilers, they were not good. At least that's what I have to assume they did, as that can be the only reason why this wily hero is transformed into an invincible Superman without intellect, wit or any nuance at all. And that's also precisely why the film itself was such a critical bust, incidentally. Number 8. Dumb and Dumberer When Harry Met Lloyd The characters, Harry and Lloyd In the first Dumb and Dumber, and even the awful belated sequel, Harry and Lloyd are semi-functional characters who might be capable of monumental feats of idiocy, yes, but who, crucially, are not defined by their stupidity. This was the key to making them sympathetic characters rather than ridiculous caricatures that nobody would like. Crucially, they had actual personalities and the ability to function in the daft situations they got themselves in. In Dumb and Dumberer, when Harry met Lloyd though, well, this wasn't so much the case. It might be a prequel, so you could therefore maybe say that the characters have matured after it, but this awful mess of a movie reimagines Harry and Lloyd as singularly moronic figures whose only defining feature is their lack of intellect. They're basically men without brains whose personalities are indistinct from their idiocy. In fact, it's almost like they're different characters entirely, so yeah, you can kind of see why everyone rejected these incarnations straight away and pined for a proper sequel. Number 7. David Brent Life on the Road The character, David Brent The best part of The Office was that, for better or worse, all the characters genuinely felt human. The writing was intentionally stripped back, and as a result we got layered characters who ran the gamut of emotions. David Brent, of course, was more extreme than other characters on the show, but despite how genuinely unlikable that he got at times, you could see his insecurities and shortcomings coming out in his behaviour as well. It's the humanity beneath the cringe-inducing behaviour that makes it so effective, and that's why his moments of profound pathos land so well. In the movie though, without Stephen Merchant's writing to balance things out, all nuance is completely flattened, and Brent becomes both a cartoon villain and a character drenched in sickly sentimentality. Ricky Gervais messes up his own greatest character, making him utterly, utterly unlikable. Here, Brent's learnt nothing from the experience on The Office, which isn't entirely unprecedented for the character, I must admit, but he's also just nasty and more bigoted than ever, and also kind of a total fool. What I'm trying to say is, he's been reduced to his worst aspects, and it makes the moments where we're supposed to root for him fall flat in a way that they never did in the original series. Number 6. Transformers the Movie, the character Soundwave Pretty much the one constant in every portrayal of Soundwave, and crucially the one that is true for the original animated series upon which Transformers the Movie is based, is that he's the fiercely loyal right-hand man to Decepticon leader Megatron. In fact, there's very little I could shake his convictions about this. But the movie seems to forget that much when the mortally wounded Megatron is jettisoned from Astro Train to allow him greater speed by the treacherous Starscream who succeeds him as Decepticon leader. The problem here is that there's no way Soundwave would have allowed this to happen. Such was his undying loyalty that the fact that he just stands by and watches his beloved leader be thrown from the train reads just completely off. It's completely out of character and makes literally kind of no sense. Number 5. Alan Partridge Alpha Papa The character Alan Partridge Alan Partridge is the genius, egotistical invention of Steve Coogan, taking in radio and TV stereotypes with aching accuracy. The world's worst boss cliches and a mild sociopathy makes pretty much everything he does wrong-headed. He's not entirely malicious of course, but he's definitely self-serving, arrogant and entirely lacks any sense of self-awareness. That makes him sound kinda awful to watch, but trust me, he's absolutely not. He's a creation of vast intellect and nuance with deep complexity and he's supposed to be as repugnant as he is tragically foolish. 
That said, he's fundamentally not one to empathise with. Obviously, Alpha Papa is designed to be a sort of die-hard parody, with Partridge himself reimagined as a very bad candidate to stand in for John McClane. But in order for that to work, you have to throw away everything you know about Alan Partridge. There's just no way that the Alan that we see in his TV shows would be this selfless ever. He is not a hero, and the idea that he could be the saviour of anything is a little bit laughable. But then, I suppose that is kinda the point of the movie in a way, it's just a shame that it wasn't brave enough to go with a more downbeat ending to suit Alan's usual spirit. In seeking more mainstream success, the filmmakers fundamentally blunted Partridge and made him too much a quirky everyman rather than a complex muddled no-man. Number 4. Independence Day Resurgence The character David Levinson Independence Day's David is the archetypal nerd who urges the president to listen to his theories on the ominous alien signal he finds. He's scared of flying, which is key, is not a man you consider to be on the front line in a fight, which is also key, and he seems to find the idea of heroism in itself somewhat vulgar, which is, of course, also key. Who knows what happened in the two decades between his appearances, but in Independence Day Resurgence, David goes from nerdy science guy to sci-fi movie action lead, and by that I mean sci-fi with a Y, not the genre, the, the network. He's as far removed from the lovable loser he is in the first movie as you could possibly imagine, and his charm suffers badly as a result. Sure, he's still Jeff Goldblum, but it's like he's getting Jeff Goldblum all wrong. The worst part of it is that this new swashbuckling evolution of the character is also nowhere near as smart as he was in the original, as if the lack of intelligence in the script required him to simply get stupider so it made sense. Number 3. On Her Majesty's Secret Service The character, James Bond Of course, Bond needs no real introduction. He is a gadget-loving, womanizing super spy as deadly with quips and seductive one-liners as he was with his trusty Walther PPK. Sure, he was a bit of a caricature even in the Sean Connery days, maybe even especially in the Sean Connery days, but he was very much the head of a beloved brand. On Her Majesty's Secret Service, though, tried to change Bond for a modern era, which of course isn't bad, it's just that they did so by essentially inverting what people were loving about the character at the time. Now, this movie is actually pretty damn good, and arguably the purest adaptation of any of the James Bond books, but it could outweigh too many of the pillars of the character the fans had come to love over so many years. In it, Bond doesn't sleep with the Bond girl, he gets married, and his gadgets and quirks have been consciously downplayed as Saltzman and Broccoli try to focus on a more serious product. Combining that with an unfairly underappreciated performance by George Lazenby, and it just doesn't feel like a real Bond of the time. Again, that's kind of why it's so curious, but it almost feels like it's not part of the franchise. Number 2. The Karate Kid Part 3 The character, Mr. Miyagi In the first two Karate Kid movies, Mr. Miyagi is a picture of composure and virtue. His demeanor, which is often completely at odds with the reckless emotional responses of his student Daniel, is pretty much the key to the entire franchise. He teaches humility, poise, and rising above at all costs. But for one ridiculous moment in the third movie, which is way better than it ought to be, frankly, Mr. Miyagi stomps all over his own legacy for the sake of a joke in the script. After rescuing Daniel from their clutches, he fights off the villains Reese and Silver, beating them with his usual ease and without any flickers of emotion. But then, as he stands victorious over Silver, he taunts him in one of the single most out of place character moments in any film. Number 1. The Lost World, the character Ian Malcolm Listen, I hate that your friend of mine Jeff Goldblum is on here twice, but the whole point of Ian Malcolm in the first Jurassic Park is that he's supposed to stick out like a sore thumb against the more heroic characters. He's a sarcastic figure who talks logic, through a snarky filter at least, and who is so bad in a fight that his only attempt at any sort of action leads to him being almost crushed and eaten alive by a T-Rex. He's basically the coolest nerd in all of film history, but he's supposed to be out of place in this world. In the sequel though, Malcolm goes from being a deadpan snarking chaos theorist to basically Indiana Jones. He doesn't even wear his glasses anymore, and is a trimmer, more all-action version of the character who has very little likeness to his former self, other than, again, looking like Jeff Goldblum. The annoying thing is, a Jurassic Park movie where the real Malcolm stepped up and had to save his girlfriend and daughter would have been way more entertaining, rather than us getting a conveniently souped up live Malcolm in his place. 
So that's our list. I want to know what you guys think down in the comments below. What do you think about these character shifts? And do you think there are any worse offenders that I missed off here? Let us know. And while you're down there, could you please give us a like, share, subscribe, and head over to whatculture.com for more lists and news like this every single day. Even if you don't, though, I've been Josh. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon.